After May 1940, the German assault on Britain began in real earnest. French and British forces had to be evacuated from the beaches of Dunkirk. The Battle of Britain then raged in the summer skies and the autumn saw the start of the Luftwaffe bombing campaign against British cities. A German invasion was anticipated. Survival for Britain demanded total mobilization and technical ingenuity, and both of these values came to be exemplified by the work of the women of Station X. In December 1941, Britain's coalition government introduced conscription for women. Vigorous propaganda campaigns were launched, exhorting women to join the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force or the Women's Royal Naval Service, who were affectionately known as the Wrens. Eventually, nearly half a million women served in the armed forces. Millions more women took jobs in factories or agriculture that had previously been done by men. Ruth Bourne was a bright sixth form student in July 1944 when she went for her interview for the Women's Royal Naval Service. Eventually, uh, on D-Day, uh, I had my first interview and uh, I was asked um, just a few things uh, such as the, uh, the work that I had done at school because I was still in the sixth form and my medical examination seemed to be all right and I was put on a train and sent up to the north of Scotland from Birmingham. From Birmingham we went to Scotland to a place called Ballock. I believe there's a castle there still and we did a fortnight of square bashing, uh, cleaning out uh, places that needed cleaning, scrubbing, learning how to march, uh, naval technology and at the end of that period of time we were what was known as mustard. In other words we were told what we were going to do and uh, a small group of us were told that we were to join HMS Pembroke 5 and we were going to do SDX and what was that? It was special duties X and when I asked well what's X? Uh, people said, well, it's not why. And in fact, it waited for 30 years before I found out what why was. Uh, it was the name for the Y stations, I understand. Um, the wireless interceptors, the wonderful girls who picked up all this rubbish on, on Morse code and uh, put it down and sent it to Bletchley. Um, and so uh, that was S the Y people and we, we were SDX. Um, and then I thought, well, at least I'll be by the sea with lots of handsome sailors. But I found no way HMS Pembroke 5 was just an umbrella word uh, to cover the activities that took place at Bletchley Park and in the outstations of Bletchley Park. It was mostly for security reasons. And so that's how I became uh, a recruit for, for this work. Bletchley Park was a manor house in Bedfordshire which the head of MI6, Admiral Sir Hugh Sinclair, had bought in 1938 as a new and larger home for the Government Code and Cipher School, of which he was then director. Signal's intelligence would be of unprecedented importance during World War II because the nature of warfare had changed. Instead of trenches and barbed wire, there would be lightning-fast, coordinated attacks with air and ground forces. At sea, submarines hunting in packs to attack convoys of merchant shipping. These methods of attack demanded a high level of coordination and across long distances. Radio telegraphy made this possible. But radio transmissions are easily intercepted, so every military command relied on codes and ciphers to keep their messages unreadable by the enemy. The Germans believed their machine-based ciphers were unbreakable. But at Bletchley Park, the British government was mobilising huge resources for intercepting and decoding enemy signals. 
Thousands of enlisted women found themselves involved in this task. We were sworn in, told that um, the work we were doing would be highly secret. There was no promotion. The pay, therefore, was not very good. And uh, there was shift work, which would be very onerous. And once we were in it, we couldn't come out. Um, and did we want to do it? And we all said yes, being young and adventurous. And then we were sworn in. Um, and then we were told that we were going to uh, actually be involved in decoding uh, German codes, breaking German codes. Um, and uh, I didn't realize at the time, and I have to say, I didn't realize for at least 30 years later what was involved. The German forces used the Enigma machine to encode messages before sending them over the radio as Morse code. The same machine could be used to decode incoming messages too. Superficially, Enigma looked like a typewriter. For each plain text letter that was typed, a corresponding code letter would light up, to be noted down by the cipher clerk. Each Enigma machine contained a set of rotors. Army and Air Force Enigmas had three rotors, and the Navy Enigma had four. Each rotor had a set of 26 input and 26 output contacts, one for each letter. But these were cross-wired, so an input letter would be transformed to a different output letter as it passed through each rotor. With three rotors, each cross-wired a different way, this letter scrambling happened three times. A three-rotor enigma was supplied with a set of five available rotors. That gave 60 different possible combinations of rotors in their slots, and each rotor can be inserted in one of 26 possible starting positions. But here was the master stroke. Each time a letter was coded, one of the rotors moved one notch. As that rotor completed a revolution, the next rotor moved one notch, and so on. Therefore, Enigma cipher patterns were actually changing with every letter. As yet one more precaution, the German military Enigma had the Steckerbrett, a pluggable panel which added another level of cross-wiring. The Enigma machine was not itself a secret. It had been marketed commercially since the 20s. But the actual internal wiring details of military Enigma machines were secret, as of course were the particular rotor sequences and start positions to be used on each new day. The cracking of Enigma was achieved by some brilliant mathematical minds. Already in 1932, Marian Rzewski a mathematician working for the Polish Cipher Bureau had used group theory to figure out the rotor wiring of the German military enigma. And in 1938, he invented an electromechanical enigma simulator called the cryptologic bomb to discover from a coded message start positions for the three rotor enigma. Alan Turing, regarded by many as the father of computing, worked with Gordon Welshman at Bletchley Park to design a British high-speed version of the cryptologic bomb. Over 200 of these machines were eventually made for the government by the British Tabulating Company. We were shown a few machines but they were only for training purposes and they were called bombs and we didn't know why and uh, anything that we were not told we weren't supposed to ask so we didn't ask. Bletchley Park became the hub of a nationwide operation. Radio operators at the Y stations faithfully transcribed the encrypted Morse code intercepts. These were sent down to Bletchley Park, initially by motorbike, but later on over teleprinter lines. Accurate teleprinter operation played an essential role. At Bletchley, 
the women who ran this equipment were accoladed as the Tele Princesses. Over time, bomb operations were decentralised to five outstations Eastcote, Stanmore, Wavendon, Adstock, and Gayhurst. Eastcott, in the London suburbs, was by far the largest, housing 110 bombs, and this is where Ruth Bourne was sent to work. I remember my very strong memory of walking a very long way from the tube station, and we had a lot of kit to carry, and it was very heavy, and we seemed to walk for miles up a place, uh, a long lane, and then we came to the barracks, and there was a flag flying and we were told this is the quarter deck so we all saluted the quarter deck with the, the salutes that we had learned in Scotland and then we were shown into our cabin because everything was nautically terminolo term terminology was nautical and in the cabin there were 72 girls sleeping on double bunks uh, in small alcoves separated by a breeze block wall and uh, I was surrounded by lots of girls who seemed to have come there before me and they'd all got the top bunks and if you had a big girl in the top bunk you were in for a stormy night but we all settled down very well and the following day we were taken over the part where we were the place where we were sleeping was called A block and the place where we were going to work was called B block and we were taken across to B Block and I was a bit surprised because there was a footpath where the public were walking across at right angles to the pathway that led from A Block to B Block and I didn't see what was so secret but actually when we arrived at B Block there were two Marines there with rifles and we had to show our passes before we were let in and then we were taken into this large area which was like a long corridor with spurs going on out at right angles on either side and each of those spurs was a bomb room and in the bomb room there were in my one one i worked in which was called norway there were 10 of these bombs all clicking away lost smell of oil no lights there were tall slitty windows at the top of a very high wall and a lot of these uh, tubes that flickered. And uh, we were allocated a girl who was there before us and a petty officer, and that's where we trained. We were faced by these bomb machines where they all had uh, a lot of uh, wheels going round and round, and they were clicking. And I think we were all very much uh, overawed, and we thought, well, how are we going to manage these enormous machines? Each bomb weighed about a tonne, and was operated around the clock in three shifts. We worked uh, eight hour shifts with half an hour off in the middle of the shift for a meal. Um, we'd do a week starting from eight till four and then we'd have a break a day and we'd come back and work for a week from four to midnight and then we'd have a slightly longer break and come back at midnight and work for a week from midnight to eight. That was the night shifts. Um, and then we'd have a, a quick turnover shift, and then we'd get four and a half days off when we could go home. Um, and uh, so that's the way the shifts worked. And we always worked with another girl. There were always two wrens to each bomb because they were so complicated that you weren't allowed to plug them up without uh, somebody overseeing you, so. Today, Bletchley Park has become a museum, telling the story of the wartime code-breaking effort and how it contributed to the development of computing. Several mock-ups of the Turing bombs have been recreated and one fully functional bomb has been rebuilt to help visitors understand what was involved. Ruth now works part-time as a volunteer, telling visitors what it was like to be a bomb operator. Well, this is a replica from the film Enigma of the real bomb, which we shall see later on. And this was the machine that I was confronted with when I started my training. Um, 
the first thing we were talk to, to talked about were these, what we call wheels. And these wheels um, are, uh, replicate the three wheels that the German operator would put into his Enigma machine uh, at the beginning of his 24-hour shift. Uh, there were five wheels on the ordinary Army, Navy, uh, Army and Air Force Enigma, and uh, he would choose three out of five, calling them one, two, three, four, five. We called them by their colours, and to begin with, we were given a set of wheel orders for each job. The main thing is that that represents one Enigma, and there were 12 sets of Enigma on each bank, so that this machine, because all these wheels were cranked so that they worked together, uh, this machine could work out the possible settings for 36 different Enigma all at one time and within 15 minutes, which was a very fast uh, machine uh, in those days. Um, and they would work exactly the same as uh, the, uh, the German Enigma worked. So that one would whiz around from A to Z. This one would move from A to B. And when that had gone round from A to Z, this moved from A to B, and so on. So that it worked out all the possible permutations uh, on, the, on those 36. Just as the Enigma machines had plug boards, the bombs had their equivalent too. Now the other bit of the menu was how we plugged up the back. And that was much more difficult. And you were not allowed to do that alone. You always had to do it with another. Your oppo, as we called it. And uh, this is the back end of it, the back of the machine. And all these large letters would represent a letter of the alphabet, which would be represented on this uh, set here of uh, different plugs and sockets, I suppose you'd call those. Uh, all we knew was that one of the most difficult things we had to do, uh, where we had to be really careful, was to take one of, these, one of these sets of plugs. There were 26 pieces here of wire, one for each letter, and there were 26 up uh, here, uh, which you had to plug in, into the connections, and you mustn't bend any of them. That was the most important thing, not to cause any short circuits. The RAF were the mechanics who serviced these machines, and they were very vital. And uh, every midnight, the RAF mechanics would come in with their trolleys, and they would open up the back of these machines and short test them were very reliable machines uh, and if they if they did go wrong the RAF people always blamed us. These uh, wheels as we called them had inside them rows of little wires. The wires looked like toothbrushes, uh, spiky, and all these little wires were on a slant and one wire must not touch another wire because they were touching commutators behind these wheels and you mustn't cause short circuits, and we were given little tweezers to tweeze them out. You, you put your first lot of wheel orders on the front, you press the button here, and the machine began to go round. This thing went out round in practically microseconds, I think. It went round very quickly, because there were all of these different permutations of 17,000. Uh, 876 ways of uh, setting these uh, three up uh, to begin with and the machine would be looking for the answer. But breaking the Enigma codes was never a purely logical or mechanical process. The principal cryptanalysts had been recruited for their linguistic and puzzle solving capabilities. They exploited contextual information about signal sources and the stereotypical nature of military communications to guess at likely components of the coded messages. They called these guesses cribs. With the cribs as a guide, the cryptanalysts prepared menus for distribution to the bomb operating teams. We got this menu, we plugged it up 
If the machine stopped, it gave you a lot of information. Uh, these three wheels, which don't match the others, would give you the settings on the side of the rotor that the German had used. You wrote all that down and you gave it to your checker. Um, one day you would be the checker, the next day you would be the operator, and then you'd work together just to plug it up at the back. The work was very humdrum, um, and we never were told what was in the uh, messages that uh, the bombs that we were operating had brought up because everything was on a need-to-know basis so you're only told what you needed to know that the job was up but uh, and that that was the highlight if, if you had your machine had uh, brought a job up you were very pleased. Winston Churchill praised the Bletchley Park staff he called them the geese that laid the golden egg and never cackled. The total secrecy they maintained is remarkable given that the total workforce involved in the decoding effort grew to nearly 9,000 staff. Intelligent German leaders, such as the U-boat chief, Admiral Dernitz, probably knew that the Enigma ciphers were crackable, in theory. They may even have suspected that Enigma machines had been captured intact, which they sometimes were, but it seems that they still felt secure knowing that the number of possible Enigma settings ran into the trillions. Dernitz could not have imagined the resourcefulness of Britain's cryptanalysts in exploiting every weakness in the German cryptographic system, nor the industrial scale on which Britain applied mechanised computation to the job of code breaking, culminating in the creation of Colossus, the world's first programmable electronic computer. Colossus was invented by post office engineers to break a high-level German teleprinter cipher known as Tunny. By mid-44, Colossus computers were equipped with 2,500 valves each and each machine was capable of testing thousands of possible solutions every second. Work on the bombs and Colossus continued until the surrender of Japan. I remember that I was actually queuing up for an inoculation on the day that the atomic bomb was dropped, 1945. Then we were told there's no more work on the bombs. From now on in, they are to be dismantled uh, because this was we were told one of the most secret machines in the world. I don't know if that's an exaggeration, but that's what we were told, and nobody was to know that uh, we had ever had these. And I remember sitting outside uh, in the sunshine um, with a soldering iron and uh, unsoldering hundreds and hundreds of little connections from bits of coloured wire, and all the wires went into boxes and all the connections into another box and I believe they were all sold as army surplus um, and the machines were dismantled and I believe the plans for the machines were torn up and um, it was for this reason that it took the computers people such a long time to rebuild the bomb because there was very little left possibly a few photographs. Almost all the machines were destroyed Everyone who had been involved with the project was warned they had signed the Official Secrets Act and must breathe a word to no one, even though the war had ended. As far as I was concerned, and I think many of us were concerned, we would never have said anything. But after 30 years, there was a book published called The Ultra Secret by uh, Captain Winterbottom. And although it wasn't 100% accurate, because in those days a lot of the information was still undercover, however, um, it, the book was published and I remember saying to my husband, oh, I can tell you, this is what I did in the war. And he said, oh, really? And that was the end of the conversation. And I think very few people read the book. However, Winterbottom's book was a signal that the establishment no longer regarded the secrecy of what went on at Station X as essential. 
Through the foundation of the Bletchley Park Trust in 1992 and the successful rebuilds of the Bomb and Colossus machines, we now have plenty of material illuminating this period in the intertwined histories of cryptography and computing. The British Computer Society has given financial support to the Bomb and Colossus rebuilds and through this documentary project has captured the stories of several of the women of Station X. Unlike the men, the mathematicians and engineers who had been fated for their subsequent work, few of the women were able to build on their wartime experiences in quite the same way and were in danger of being written out of history. The British Computer Society Oral History Project has given the Golden Geese a voice. And this is just one project in the larger task of compiling a BCS archive and documentary site that will record the contribution that women and men have made in building the UK computer industry.